Hello and welcome to this Red Gamer Tech video, myself and Marta. As always, I'm here with the latest from the tech world in the last 24 or so hours. So, to kick things off today, I have some rumours regarding Zen 2. And what we actually have regarding this for you today is thanks to the folks over at bitsandchips.it, or more specifically, their Twitter feed, where they have posted that apparently, allegedly, the Zen 2 architecture is going to bring an average of 13% IPC, which of course instructions per clock, uplift versus Zen Plus. Now you may recall that for Zen Plus versus the original Zen, it was a 3% increase in IPC. So we are seeing a significant jump in just this one area for Zen 2, if this information is correct. Now they do specify that this is in scientific tasks, so we don't know what Zen 2 chip this is. It could be Epic 7NM Rome, for instance. There's no gaming results available at present. Now, unfortunately, this is all that Bits and Chips had to share with us, but I do just want to point out that if you cast your mind back a little ways, we did have some rumours that the Zen 2 architecture was going to be bringing IPC games of roughly 10 to 15 percent. So this does line up with that. But of course, again, we do not know which Zen 2 CPU this actually is. We don't know what test this was, all that sort of stuff. But regardless of all that, this is still looking rather impressive because again, Zen Plus yielded a 3 percent IPC lift and here we're seeing 13 percent. So we saw the gains with just 3%. Imagine what 13% plus the clock speeds and everything else that Zen 2 is undoubtedly going to bring to the table is actually going to give us. I'm very, very excited now to see what Zen 2 has for us. Next up, we have an announcement from Intel, which actually, for once, for the last few weeks, is nothing to do with the ninth generation. <gasps> I know. What we actually have here is an announcement that they are going to be partnering with ARM. And this is going to be regarding the Internet of Things, or IoT. So basically what they're doing here is partnering with ARM to securely connect, quote, any device to the cloud. They have further announced that they've expanded their Intel Secure device on board to ARM-based devices, which in itself is going to expand support for IoT practitioners to automatically provision their devices to the cloud platform of their choosing. So obviously this isn't something for you or I. This is something for your enterprise, your commercial, people doing AI, predictive stuff, computing, all that sort of side of things. So again, while it's not directly for you and I, it is in theory going to bring benefits to all of us, both directly and indirectly. I've spoken many times how an innovation made in a completely different sector of tech can kind of trickle down an idea to gaming or something PC related and affect us directly in that way. That's definitely one of the things that I love the most about technology. Now I'd actually have a statement here from Intel, which clarifies a little bit. This is from Michelle Menting, the director of ABI Research. And she said, quote, Intel and ARM are simplifying, simplifying excuse me, one of the IoT's most complex and challenging barriers with regarding to streamlining the manufacturing and security deployment workflows for IoT. This is an ROI win for the customer who will deploy both Intel and ARM-based devices at a lower cost and with less friction between IT and OT, while at the same time retaining flexibility over their data and cloud partner choice until the deployment phase. So essentially what Intel are trying to do here is using is to use rather their secure device on board to help people install IoT devices more efficiently and also reduce the amount of time spent pre-configuring their devices and obviously this is going to be again expanded to ARM devices. So you're not going to be locked into a single cloud provider's provisioning method or even a single device architecture. So this lends some much needed flexibility to the whole Internet of Things situation. So, yeah, as I said, it's not going to be for your eye directly, at least not in the gaming sense at the moment. But this could be very, very interesting if it actually pans out in the real world, of course. There's been a whole lot of kerfuffle about the Internet of Things, but of course there's been a few concerns, mostly regarding the lack of built-in security, and obviously the concern of the botnets as well. So there's there's still criticisms and eyebrows to be raised, to be sure. But this is definitely a step in the right direction, is what I will say. 
But we're going to move on from that to an update on DDDR5. And what we actually have here is an update from Cadence and Micron regarding DDDR5 and how we're going to be seeing 16 GB chips very soon. They are on track for 2019. I just want to say that this particular piece of news is thanks to Cadence, but I did see it on Anantec, so a big thank you to them. But what improvements are we actually going to be seeing with this new memory technology? Well, we're going to be seeing increased transfer speeds over the previous iteration, which is pretty awesome. And we're also going to be seeing reductions in operating voltage. And we're also expecting to see the number of DDR channels on their processors being expanded, this being obviously being on CPU vendors side of things, from 12 to 16, which will help drive memory sizes to 128 gigabytes from the 64 that we actually see today. We also of course see stability related features and of course performance and we could see DDR5 including the use of two independent 32 40-bit channels per module with or without, with or without excuse me, ECC, improved command bus efficiency with per channel 7-bit address buses, better refresh schemes and and increased bank group for additional performance. But also, higher end DDDR5 DIMMs are actually going to have their own voltage regulators and PMICs, which is of course going to improve power delivery. And I'm sure some of you are going nodding your heads going, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you just, you, you sure said some words there, but what are we actually seeing in terms of real world improvements in performance? Well, if you look at the Cadence article, which I will link in the description below this video, you will see some charts, which of course I will be showing throughout this particular segment as well. But you'll also note that there is an increase when you look at DDR4 3200 versus DDR5 3200, there's an increase in bandwidth of 1.36 times. So... Add in the speed up and compare DDR4 3200 to DDR5 4800, there is an increase of 1.87 times, which is uh, not too shabby at all. So as I say, the long and short of it is, this new technology is just going to improve things all round. It is on track for 2019, so we can fully expect it to pre be in pretty much everything ever by 2020, if indeed this prediction holds true. But let's move on to something rather interesting from Remedy and Ray Tracing. So of course, ever since the release of the RTX 2080 and of course 2080 Ti, we've been talking an awful lot about Ray Tracing. Now obviously the 20 series cards are a, mm, a touch expensive to say the least. And even with the power that they do bring to the table, the impact of Ray Tracing is still going to be fairly, well, meaningful. But now we have an interesting experiment done by the developers over at Remedy, who are working on a game by the name of Control. It's actually going to be one of the first games with RTX support. Now they have shown an interesting video, which of course is going to be playing, but will also be linked in the description below this video, where they have shown some preliminary, preliminary tests excuse me, with its North Light engine. Sadly, no raw FPS numbers, but we do see in this experimental scene, they were able to evaluate the cost of enabling ray tracing. There is a 9.2 millisecond performance overhead per frame in total, 2.3 to compute shadows, 4.4 to compute reflections, and 2.5 for global denoising lighting. And you're going, okay, what does that actually mean? Well, the 9.2 milliseconds that all adds up to is actually going to add up, just to kind of put this into some sort of context for you. Playing at 30 requires 33 milliseconds, and playing at 60 requires 17 milliseconds per frame. So the impact of 9, as you would imagine, is actually pretty not great, to be honest. This is again at uh, 1080p. Of course, the technology is not out yet, the drivers are not out yet for it, all that sort of thing, that the games will better support it, the technology will improve, it will be less demanding as time goes on. This is, of course, the first iteration of this technology, but we're looking at if these numbers are correct and if they don't improve um, between now and the release of RTX, that being ray tracing, of course, we're looking at about 40 FPS on a 2080 Ti at a resolution of 1080p with ray tracing enabled. So 
that was done on an experimental engine with obviously drivers that aren't meant for ray tracing all that sort of stuff that i've already said so do keep all that in mind not don't get the doom and gloom bells out just yet but again just kind of showcases how demanding ray tracing actually is the fact that these cards can pull it off at all at a playable frame rate is a testament to what they've actually managed to achieve that being nvidia but obviously we've still got a ways to go. And speaking of the 20 series, I just want to finish up with something quick because you may have seen the image floating around from Gigabyte, which directly mentions a RTX 2070 tile, which of course has got people all in a flap. And it's a promo teaser for the Halloween season from Gigabyte. So just you know, happy Halloween for every purchase of the Aorus RTX 2080 tie, 2070 graphics card, you get a limited edition Aorus t-shirt for free. It's basically all that it says. But... While this did send the internet into a titty gigabyte, I've been very quick to say, guys, calm yourselves. It's just a typo. And I do have a response here from a gigabyte employee on Reddit who says, quote, can confirm this is a typo. Sorry, guys, a couple of things. First, no such card exists, seriously. Second, if you don't believe me and think it does exist, look at the typical turnaround for high-end models. Aorus cards usually come one to two weeks after the launch of gigabyte cards, i.e. Gaming OC, Windforce. This promotion ends November the 15th. That means in less than a month you would see a new card, never before even rumoured, then the high-end variant, all in the next 30 days. Not to mention that 30 days includes skewing up and selling in what appears to be Singapore, a market that usually lags behind in on shelf availability. So, yeah, it's pretty much thrown water all over those flames of rumour, guys. And uh, he makes a pretty solid argument that unfortunately this is just a typo or a mistake. Either way, it's not a thing from what they're saying. But... That has been done for this video. Thank you so much for watching. This is what really does mean a huge deal to both myself and Paul. And I'll see you next time.